Um, so this is Mel here. I'm going to introduce a very distinguished guest, um, Professor Dr. Robert Kerr. Um, he has studied classics and Semitics in Vancouver, Tubingen and Leiden. He's director of the Inara Institute for Research on Early Islamic History and the Quran in Saarbrücken, Germany. And he has an area of interest in Punic um, epigraphy. And he also teaches on Heidegger. Um, that be a fair summation? <laughs> okay, yes, yes, yeah. <laughs> um, I, 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 looking at um, a, a site where you have uh, papers, I think you're associated with about 59 different papers that you maybe have written directly or maybe were editing, and uh, you've got a, quite a few books as well. Yes, well, I do not uh, count them anymore. So no? I, I... <laughs> Every yeah. time, time I have something, I think I, it just happens, and then uh... yeah. One of my favorite papers. I haven't read many of your papers, and I'm, 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 you're uh, probably one of my favorites uh, in terms of this area is the language of the Quran. And mm. I found I found that a real eye opener when I read it, uh, particularly the the maps that you had, which uh, dealt with Arabia, Petraea, and how. The language there was a combination of Aramaic and Arabic, and the image that occurred to my mind as I read it was the, uh, the image of a sea, and the sea represents the Aramaic, and the sand is the Arabic, and the shell is the Quran. And it contains a bit of the water and the and the sand, a kind of a, like a peculiar mixture. That's what occurred to me. I don't know if it's a good no, no, analogy. It's a good comparison. Yes, yes. Um, and I think it's a. It's a good kind of uh, lead into the, the topic that I'd like to discuss with you, which is um, where Islam began, the origins of Islam, in particular, the, the question of Mecca. Um, now, there, there are a number of people that have dealt with this in different ways, um, like there's some uh, scholars like Angelica Newitz, who kind of accepts the tradition. She does source criticism um, and she's phenomenal at it, but she doesn't really question the tradition all that much. And then Shoemaker, um, tends to question the tradition, but he kind of holds on to Mecca, which is a bit surprising. And then Dan Gibson, he he kind of turns it the other way around. He kind of accepts tradition by and large, but just moves the location differently. Now, people like Patricia Crona and um, Edward Marie Gallais would suggest that it the location is wrong and it's further up north. Um, then Fred Donner has suggested when he was asked uh, in an interview where he thought the origins of Islam, he he said Jerusalem and Iraq. Um, so, what are your thoughts on that? Where would you kind of fit in the, in all of that? Well, yeah, you opened up a whole can of worms here. Um, so <laughs> that's, what, that's what I tend to do. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So I'll try to um, address it as best as I can, uh, one thing for um, one thing at a time. Yeah. And initially, so you referred to the language. And so my problem is, you know, based on what we, what we know of late antiquity and um, and being initially an epigraphist, um, the point is, is that if the Quran or and or Islam, which are not necessarily both the same thing, at, at least in the early period, um, had their origins in the Hijaz in Mecca and Medina, I would expect the Quran to have been written in a different Semitic language and uh, using a different script and, uh, and a script that could accommodate all of the where all of the graphemes of the alphabet or the abjad, depending how you define it, could accommodate all the phonemes of the spoken language. And in Arabia, we had that script, a derivation of the Sabaic script, and you wouldn't have all of this um, need for diacritics. And secondly, the other problem is if you're outside of the Roman Empire and all of the early church fathers are and references to what uh, became Islam, the heresy of the Arabs, let us say, just to call it that. Yeah. If it's outside of the Roman Empire, there could be no heresy because the heresy was always in relation to the imperial orthodoxy, which came from Constantinople or 
the Council of Church Synods. So outside, you know, look at the Nestorians. They were branded heretics. They left the Roman Empire. They crossed the Euphrates, went into Iraq, and had a great career into China for centuries. Yeah. So you wouldn't have a... Um, it wouldn't have been a problem. And so you only can have a heresy inside of the Roman Empire where imperial orthodoxy held sway. Yeah. That is the, uh, so you would expect a different language, a different script, and um, not to be a heresy if it was outside of the Roman Empire. But if it's, if you look at early Islam, and if you're in the Hijaz in Mecca or somewhere in Medina, wherever, down there. Where would you find the theological literacy that is reflected in the Quran? I mean, so you have a reception of the Bible, but it's clearly academic. It's by theologians. It's not by... Um, Illiterate, uh, uh, what do you call that? Illiterate, um, uh, generals or something? No, Ill illiterate, um, um, the people who run caravans. What do you call that? Um, illiterate merchants, yeah, yeah, like Muhammad was supposed to have been. And, um, it, it's a high degree. And if you look at the Kiraat, the variant readings of the Quran. There obviously only make sense in the written transmission. They're not oral things. It can only have happened through the written path. Good. If you take all of the uh, evidence into account, we could discuss this another time if you want. But um, so the the language, the writing the theological con uh, content, but also the implicit controversies, especially regarding Christology, all must refer to somewhere where you have theologically literate people debating this, where this form of Arabic was spoken, and that is the Jazirat al-Arab, which is sort of on the uh, Iraqi Syrian Turkish border today. So it's cut, it's considered a Jazira, an island, because it's cut by the rivers. Yeah. <clears throat> and that's the Arabia of classical antiquity. So um, we have to remember if you read the classical Pliny and Strabo and the classical geographers, Arabia is always in the north. Yeah. yeah. Which is yeah. roughly Arabia Patre Petrea. Uh, and the rest of it is only Arabia by extension. And deserta, Arabia deserta in Latin, well, desert means empty. It doesn't mean, so the desert Arabia, but it means the deserted Arabia. Yeah. Because there's nobody there and there's nothing happening there. And remember also the, the these Arabian Jews we only have in the Islamic tradition that are hanging out in the Hijaz or doing what have you. They're only there in, so we have Jews in Yemen, but between uh, Felix Arabia, which is Yemen, it's a translation mistake from Yaman, which is South Arabia actually, but since yeah. your right is lucky and sinister, yeah. left is north, so that's, so it's a translation mistake in the Latin, but of course, you know, there is this deserted Arabia in between. And so in the Christian period, which is rather similar to the modern period, <clears throat> the Yemen was fed by from the Red Sea and from the Persian Gulf. So there was a Christianity or like now in Islam coming from the Persian Gulf and one from the Red Sea. And when they meet, there are problems. And of course, there were Arabs, also Christian Arabs, who originally hailed from uh, what is now called Oman and Qatar. Beit, uh, Beit Qatar is known in the Syriac sources. But, but they came by sea. They didn't come with the land route. And so Yemen is not representative of what we would now call Saudi Arabia. That was a culture of its own. Yeah. So... 
Um, we, if you look at the allusions in the Quran to Christian and Jewish literature, I mean, these have to have been literate people with libraries. Yeah. Uh, doing theological uh, reflection and not, um, yeah, illiterate merchants who, uh, what have you. It, it doesn't really um, work that way. It doesn't make so much sense. So I would say we have to look elsewhere. And if you make a map of the script, the language, the theological content, the controversies, sort of Jesus, we accept the virgin birth as in the Quran, but we do not expect ac accept that Christ was the, or Jesus was the son of God in the biological sense, etc., etc. You, it all points somewhere to uh, the northeast, the language, yes. the script. And I mean, this is where we find in um, in Greek and Aramaic sources. Uh, you know, in Hatkala, they talk about the Mal Malkada Arab, and we also have this from Urfa, uh, the Sultan Sultan de Arab, and in uh, Dura Europos, they talk about the Archeo Arabes. This is the Arabia, this is where it's happening, this is where this language is spoken, and these are where these theological debates that are reflected in the Quran were happening. As for Jerusalem, a monotheistic religion, especially an eschatological one, you need Jerusalem. It doesn't yeah. work without um, Jerusalem. So the question is with Mecca, good. Uh, Patricia Crona, in her Meccan trade, she asks the right questions. And Galez uh, uh, pursues on this in the right sense. I would have some disagreements, but we'll get to that later today, I hope. Yeah. But the point is, if, as per the Quran, that the um, Mecca was the mother of all cities, um, and this is the question that Krona asks, if this was a rich merchant city, what were they selling and or trading? What was the cause of its richness? And the only conclusion she, she could come up with was um, vending leather for the Roman army. But I would disagree because we know quite a bit about where the Roman army procured their leather from. And it wouldn't have been um, a profitable business, you know, to Particularly sell. with the... the with the length of time it would take to travel on camels 30 days up to Syria and, and down again, it would make no sense. No. Especially when, when they can actually get leather up in that neck of the woods quite easily and, and probably an awful lot cheaper. Yeah, exactly. And uh, a lot cheaper there because, you know, the livestock that you had at um, in Mecca, you also had in the north. So there's no... Uh, um, and good. And then there is the problem with the lack of water in Mecca and it not being on any established uh, trade route. Um, so there are questions as to why and good. We have in the Islamic tradition a lot of um, stuff with Abraham and Ismail and Hagar being uh, so Abraham leaving Hagar there and according to some Islamic traditions, he came every other weekend, let us say, like a good stepdad and uh, yeah. Yeah. visited it, uh, visited Hagar and uh, Ishmael. <clears throat> but it all seems a little bit um, fantastic also because there is a controversy and it's not really clear from the Quran and you have to go to the commentators, the Mufasirun, who in the Quran is actually being sacrificed and by by all accounts, it must have been Isaac still. So this Ismail character only appears, or Ismail, the first son, only appears um, later. 
And this is also a product of reflections that we find in Jewish traditions, because, I mean, it's clear from any reader of Genesis that when Abraham made the covenant, covenant with God, Ishmael was there, and Isaac wasn't even yet in the planning, you know. Yeah. And we find this reflected in the Targum, the Aramaic, Jewish Aramaic translation of Genesis, where I think it's Genesis 21 or 22, that it's where the Targum Jonathan also gives a lot of commentary, it just doesn't translate the biblical text. But they... Actually, just, uh, just on that point, there's um, a book by Beverly Mortensen, The Priesthood in Targum, Pseudo Johnson, which mm. delves into that and it's fascinating to read, but sorry to interrupt you. No, no, go ahead. No problem. Um, so the problem here is, is that um, the um, in the Targum there, there's a big debate about between Ishmael and Isaac. I think it's at the death of Abraham or whatever. Who is the beloved son? You know, and Isaac's going, well, it's clear, you know, I was the beloved because I nearly got sacrificed. And Ishmael goes, yeah, but when uh, dad made his covenant with God, I was there and I got circumcised and, you know, where were you? Uh, yeah. So this is a debate. And it's also the debate because the, um, according to the Torah, the Jewish law, the firstborn is the firstborn and they don't distinguish like we do, or, you know, between illegitimate children and uh, legitimate children. This is an invention of Josephus in his antiquities. Um, that, uh, but it's his explanation using, looking at Jewish history through, a Hellen, through Hellenistic glasses of a problem that you find in the, rabbinical literature, and that was, why did Ishmael have to leave? And because even in the Torah, the firstborn is the firstborn, and we don't distinguish yeah. between the women yeah. who bore them, but it's clear still that in the Quran, it, it would by all accounts, it's Isaac that was being um, uh, sacrificed. And in the early uh, Tafsir, we find that too. It's only later that it becomes changed to Ishmael. And this is something we we find um, can explain where this development comes from. But um, it's clear that we're dealing with a later reinterpretation and it's clear also that this Mecca doesn't really originally make that much sense, but also the testimony we have in the Islamic tradition, which I should remind, I think you know, your viewers probably do know, but it's all rather late. It's all late yeah. eight into the ninth century. So I think to quote Patricia Crona, at best we can say we knew what they at the end of the 8th and the early 9th century thought happened in the early 7th century. So, yeah. uh, you know, about two centuries beforehand. But none of these people cite sources. Yeah. So, and what you also find with the um, uh, Islamic traditional literature, especially with relating to this stuff, is that the later authors know more than the early authors do. Yeah, yeah. So if uh, if uh, Ibn Ishaq, i.e. Ibn Hisham, because we don't have Ibn Ishaq, mentions something, then Ibn Sa'ad knows more details and Waqidi gives you the whole, uh, the whole 10 yards. Yeah. And so the tradition is growing legs, as it were, as time goes it's by. It's growing legs, like, and you get the impression, you know, that somebody listened to it and going, yes, but, you know, who was there at the Battle of Badr? Yeah. Or who, how do we know, you know, so they're filling in the blanks that are left by the earlier yeah. tradition. Yeah. And that gives always rise to hermeneutic uh, suspicion. Yeah. 
that there's some, you know, that this is being invented as we go along. Because if you look at how much first-hand evidence do we have of the, you know, the period in which Muhammad was supposed to have lived? Yeah. Zero. And even how much do we have of the Umayyad period? How many first-hand sources do we have from the Umayyad period? It's really hardly anything. And of course, what one also has to do, you know, with uh, philological scientific rigor, with historical criticism, and I know some people say, yeah, this is only designed for Western texts, but good, if we're going to go down that route that um, everybody has their own science, well, you know, then we can stop this conversation now because it's impossible to know anything. Yeah, and then it just becomes an expression of your own personal opinion, prejudice, and Good. I'm, I'm and, and then not. just feeling and passion just is uh, it replaces um, scientific verification. Yeah, exactly. Let's go and have a beer then, and uh, then and discuss cricket, and not this. Yeah. You know. Um, yeah. Uh, that. Uh, so the point is, is that. The philological method was designed for text and has been steadily improved based on texts. And, you know, it's used on all kinds of texts. It's used on, without any criticism, on the Vedas with Sanskrit. It's, I've seen it used on the Chinese text. Nobody seems to complain. But somehow, if it's Islamic text, then everything is different, apparently. But... <laughs> But we help only have these later traditions. We have to ask ourselves how these guys knew what they were know, knew what they wrote, and are we dealing with the preservation of a tradition, or as often happens in these type of affairs, are they inventing a tradition? Yeah, I mean we see something similar in the Old Testament happening after the exile. The supposed exile with um, um, Ezra and Nehemiah and, you know, with the Torah being revealed again and what have you. Well, is it being revealed again or they did they just not have it beforehand? Um, is this something from the Achaemenid period? Yeah. So do you, do you think, uh, I'm going to have to raise this question, you know, I think it's one that Shoemaker has dealt with, but does this necessarily necessitate a conspiracy or do you think it's um, just a combination of lots of people giving their little snippet to the overall narrative and it just builds over time evolves well good often historical critical islamic studies when you question the tradition yeah it's seen okay good if you question the tradition and what have you you are supposing that there that the early, early Islamic history was a some type of a cover-up conspiracy thing of you know people in trench coats and fedoras yeah. meeting in the back alley of Mecca at mid after midnight. Well, you know that's one way to discredit research. I don't think we need you know if you do a source critical analysis of the Arabic texts, you do not need to presuppose a conspiracy theory because you see that these texts have evolved over time yeah yeah <clears throat> and and also one what one must not do which is often done i mean one must not do it but that does not prevent people from doing it of course is um you cannot interpret prima facie evidence let's say from the seventh century with traditions that we only find written in the late 8th or early 9th century. So, for example, if we find Memcha Memdal, Muhammad or Mahmad or however you want to vocalize it, Muhammad, Mahmad, whatever, on a 7th century coin, we cannot take that as prima facie evidence that they are referring to the Muhammad of Islamic tradition, which only commences a century and a half at least later yeah so the question here is 
how do we know what we know? So uh, what sources are we um, basing ourselves on? So you do not need a, you know, a conspiracy theory is a good way to shut down any critical inquiry into anything. But no, my point is that you don't need a conspiracy because the question is, I mean, these are complicated issues with Muhammad. Who and what is Muhammad? When does he arise? Because, I mean, what is the first-hand evidence we have of Muhammad in the early 7th century doing anything? Do we really need him for the Quran? Because, I mean, he's only mentioned four and a half times if we take Ahmed with it in the Quran. Those seem largely to be interpolations. Yeah. And, I mean, would you believe a, you know, something like a not to... Um, not that I'm trying to promote any other view or be apologetic to any other view, but just for the sake of argument, let us say, if you would take the New Testament, which is supposed to be a, about some guy called Jesus of Nazareth, you know, would you would anybody believe it if it just mentioned Jesus of Nazareth four times in the entire New Testament, which is about the same length as the Quran? Yeah, yeah, it would be very suspicious. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. So what do we know? Uh, and you increasingly, you know, we can discuss this at an, another talk if you want, but it's it's clear that the Muhammad has been read into the Quran. Yeah. As the Germans say, hineingelesen. And the um, the you know, major events from his life, like the Battle of Battle of Badr and what have you, and everything, you find this with the Asbab al-Nuzul. But I have the impression that the Asbab al-Nuzul, the circumstances of revelation, which is always a rather arbitrary technique, you know, also for abrogation and what have you, to make sense of the text, seemingly. But it's not so much there to explain the text, but it's there to show we know when every verse was revealed. So like, you know, other guys have scriptures, the Al Al-Kitab, they have scriptures. But yeah, when did God reveal this to Moses or to whoever, Elijah or, uh, no, well, Elijah didn't write anything, but Ezekiel or Isaiah or whoever. Yeah. Um, so it's not there so much to explain the text, but to show that we know exactly when the text was revealed. But this then implies another theological problem. Because it would imply that God knew before the beginning of time, or Allah knew before the beginning of time, what Muhammad was going to do. <laughs> and it already, um, what do you call that in English? Predestination? or Yeah, predestination. He'd also, yeah, but he'd already made... Um, um, taken precautions by, by writing the Quran. Yeah, yeah. in so such a way that it fitted in with the circumstances that would that arise happened. at the point of revelation. Yeah. So, which would imply that Allah is not omnipotent, which, good, well, then we're getting into the finer things of theology here, but it, it is yeah. just, let us say, a curious circumstance. Yeah. Like even coupled with that mention of uh, Muhammad only mentioned, well, we'll say four and a half times, those instances where it occurs by comparison to other phrases in the Quran, you could easily interpret as being referring to Jesus. Mm. So, it, you know, there's a, a strong question mark about whether it is actually referring to the, the, the well, what we I, might call the historical Muhammad, I, if he, if he, if he exists. I would confer they it does rather refer to uh, this it uses the phraseology wherever everywhere else refers to Jesus. Yeah. And I would also say that Muhammad, if it's anything, it's it's not a personal name. It's a title. And I would suggest the Quranic usage comes from Hebrew, because if you look in the Hebrew Bible, 
in a large part of the, in many cases where you find the Hamad, maybe not in the Hebrew Bible itself, but certainly in the Jewish exegetical tradition, which was taken on by the Christians, yeah. it always has a messianic overtone. And yeah. so this, this Chemdat HaGoyim, not maybe in the sense of how it's in the Old Testament, but certainly how it was understood in the later, it's always the Messiah who's coming, i.e. in the context of late antiquity, for the Jews, the Messiah is coming for the first time, and for the Christians, the parousia, the second time. Yeah. Is this connected with the uh, the phrase, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord? Is that, mm. that, is that Hamid the same as the, the word blessed there? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, okay. yeah, blessed and uh, yeah, that that is the um, that is the translation of uh, of the Latin. But in Haggai here, we find uh, that Saint Jerome translated it in the Vulgate. This chemdat hagoim is uh, desideratus, the desired one. Yeah, which. Yeah fits very well in with the Hebrew sense of the term, and I would suggest, because if you look at the early vocalized transcriptions of uh, of the root, or no, of the word mem, cha, mem, dal, so that leaves us, Syriac doesn't help us because it's not vocalized, but let us stay with Greek and Coptic, and I think Greek uses the spiritus lenis, the rough breathing. So ma'amad. And uh, Coptic uses a sign adopted from demotic, which uh, the oti, uh, so they took, the cops took over the Greek alphabet for some sounds, they used demotic signs. But these guttural sounds were had become quiescent in Coptic. And this... OG sign was largely used for the spiritus asper in Greek from the adoption, so it's not Muhammad, Mahmud. And you get the impression because these writings, Ma'amad or what have you, are what you find from Hebrew Mahmud, which of course have nothing to do with Muhammad yeah. in Arabic. And of course, if you look at Turkish Mehmed and Latin Mahometus and what have you, they can never come from Muhammad. I mean, phonology is yeah. also a discipline of uh, science. You know, everybody says that the Semites wrote without vowels. Well, this might be, this is true in many cases, in most cases. This doesn't mean that they spoke without vowels. Yeah. So I think what happened was is that. Mahmad was originally a messianic term, and once they gave up the messianic expectation, you know, um, you know, if you predict the coming of the Messiah once too often, you have a credibility problem. Yeah, yeah. And you know, many sects have experienced this over the time. Um, the so I think the what happens is is that the the title was Arabicized and then biographicized, if you excuse the neologism, but <laughs> i.e. The, if you look at the Sirat and if you look at the intertextuality of the Sirat, yeah. I mean, it's a potpourri of you know, the New Testament, but I mean, if you look at the Battle of the Trench, that's, of course, a battle of uh, Belisarius, one of Justinian's generals in the 6th century. Yeah. There is a certain overlap with um, the life of Heraclius, you know, with being crowned in 610, uh, the start of prophecy around 610. Yeah. Uh, 622, um, moving from one city to another, Heraclius goes from Constantinople to Ctesiphon to destroy the Persian Empire. Muhammad goes from Mecca to Medina. Yeah. Uh, the Battle of the Trench, uh, 
Isn't there a, like return it, to Jerusalem and the yeah. return to Mecca happened in 629 yeah. around this time? What I've noticed uh, with the Islamic tradition is there is an attempt to aggrandize Muhammad in on many different levels. Like that would be one example, kind of making him like Heraclius. But um, you know, the there's definite parallels between Muhammad and the Buddha in terms mm. of tradition. Born in the year of the elephant. You know, um, the Buddha's mother had a, a dream of an elephant. You know, um, there's also the 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 Burak, which kind of suggests a shaman as well. You know, the, there's a, a Zoroastrian tradition of uh, a king that rides on a demon and enters the, you know, I think it's the seventh heaven. It's very much like um, Muhammad's story. Um, so there's an attempt, I think, to take from the different traditions to aggrandize in whatever way and and um yeah it's that's what makes it a little bit harder to kind of decipher and you have that popcorn effect in the traditions as, mm. as a result oh i concur i concur and i think what's happening that's taking us a little bit further away from but just to touch on it briefly you know when i think Islam is largely, the, you can only speak of Islam emerging in the Abbasid period, so whatever happened in the preceding Umayyad period, um, it's not Islam as such, so it's always the question like when do these, when is something something? Sort of, so, you know, we know that Luther didn't want to invent Lutheranism, and Marx said he wasn't a Marxist, yeah. Um, but sort of when does something begin to stand on its own? And, you know, in Christianity, we talk about the 200 silent years, the first, you know, two centuries, you know, where we don't have churches or anything. And, you know, even in later periods, the relationship with Judaism depends on where you are and who you're dealing with. Yeah. And. I think in the seventh century, it's it's clear that we're dealing with some heterodox, you know, viewed from the point of orthodox. I'm not trying to take sides, but you have to try to yeah. be explained. But since most of the authors we have represent the imperial orthodoxy, so they viewed it as a heresy. And it's a heresy. I mean, I wouldn't tie myself down to which particular one because I don't know if all of these heresies ever actually existed in the form that, you know, Epiphanius in his Panarion describes them. Yeah. But it gives a certain, sheds light on certain tendencies. Yeah. And there are parallels, you know, which pose chronological difficulties with the Ebionites and the Nazar Nazarenes. But, you know, let's just say it sticks out that you have groups earlier but whose traditions lived on, even if the groups as such didn't, or their writings anyway, which as Shlomo Pina showed, certainly continue to be transmitted. But, you know, when you have groups that say, okay, good, Jesus, he wasn't the son of God, but we accept the virgin birth. And the form of adoptionism, it's a form of adoptionism, not in the classical formulation, but, you know, with... Jesus at the cross being replaced at the last minute. We won't get into too many, tie ourselves down with details here right now. But yeah. um, that this is also something that's well known from different Christian groups, because I think in the period we're discussing, we have to talk, for example, about Christianities. Yeah. I was just going to say to you about... Um... The, the the fact that Mecca appears only once in the Quran 48 to 24, if you were just to read it without any view of the tradition um, and you just replace the word Mecca with anything else, you would not infer from that that you're referring to a place down the Hijaz. It's it's not obvious even that it's the name of a town or a, or a village or a hamlet. And it occurs to me that um, the word Mecca sounds very much like the Hebrew word Mecca, which refers to plague or strike. And it, in my interpretation of it, it could easily refer to the story of Moses, where you have this separation of the sea and the separation of the Pharaoh's men from the, 
the Jewish people, like, um, uh, it is he who withheld their hands from you and your hands from them within Mecca. Um, mm. So it's, a, it's a, maybe a, a crazy idea, but just, get, you know, in, in terms of the vagueness of the text, at least, it's not obvious that this is about a place in the Hejaz. And there's probably multiple interpretations you could give. Um, but this is the only reference to, to Mecca in the Quran, and that's that's a bit odd. I think that fits in with what you're saying about the idea that the you know, the Quran and Islam are two very distinct things from each other. Yeah, good. So good. Whether Maka here res, refers to the uh, the plagues of Moses in or of in Egypt in Exodus, why Adiakum Anhum be Batni Makata. Well, within Mecca, where whether that refers to plague or that, I'm not sure. I'm not sure what um, uh, Mecca uh, refers to here, but the 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 you are um, correct that it's 4824 al-Fatr. And he it is who hath withheld men's hands from you and hath withheld your hands from them in the valley of Mecca after he made you victors over them. Allah is seer of what you do. I think that's Pictal's mm. translation. Yeah. Um, it is unclear. Yeah. And if we then go to, um, and the large problem here is... Um, that especially since um, Gibbon rise and fall of the Roman Empire, he talks to about a city called Makaroba, and that's somehow related to Mecca. The problem is that there's Makaroba that we know from the classical sources. It's on a river, which doesn't really apply to Mecca, which has no water. Yeah. And Except for Zamzam, but we know from Islamic tradition that this was supposedly um, blocked or clogged or something. So it's and not Queen real... Zubeda had to get an aqueduct built in the the latter end of the eighth century because of the the water shortage. So uh, we can't even refer to the aqueducts at that at that time. So no. Makaraba is definitely out. No, and this and this building of the aqueduct is an important thing because this is about the period when Mecca starts to become important for nascent Islam, and um, the um, so they obviously need water there. And I mean, Mecca it floods occasionally when it rains because it's in a valley, yeah. but you can't keep the water. And uh, so, you know, yeah, so if you're going to turn it into a pilgrimage site, you're going to need a water supply. And I think this is an important indication about as to the period when Mecca starts becoming important. I, there are people there, the large numbers of people there that need water. And yeah. the, I think these type of testimonies are important because you can deduce something from them. The, so Makaroba, and I think the problem here is that Gibbon was basing himself on Ptolemy's geography, and they didn't have, I think it's uh, lo longitude in those days. And what you see is that if you look at Ptolemy's coordinates with uh, what he gives, in the Mediterranean, he's very exact. But the further a way you get and when you look at the map based on his work, you know, China and India, which were well known in the period, but they become skewed in the length. Yeah. And if you apply this here with uh, Makoroba, you're dealing with somewhere in the Yemen, where there yeah. are, of course, harbors and rivers. And if you look at the um, Periplus Maris Eretriae, which is a, uh, I think it's a third or fourth century anonymous uh, handbook on how to navigate the Red Sea, you know, everybody says, you know, stick to the African coast, because if you get shipwrecked on the Arabian coast, uh, you're either going to die on the rocks, and if you survive that, the natives are going to uh, turn you into uh, Kentucky Fried uh, Human. Yeah, yeah. And um, 
and etc cetera, etc cetera. so there are no natural harbors there really you know Jeddah was something but based on the evidence we have it seems to have been you know a place where there were local fishermen but it's not a harbor in the classical sense of the word yeah. where anybody stopped for um supplies so makarova yeah. this idea of gibbon good you know when gibbon was writing you could make the argument possibly but you know we now have phonetics and we know about the the new grammarians the neue grammatiker and we know about sound changes so, if anybody can explain how you get from Makaroba to Makka, I'll be willing to listen to you in a convincing term. This yeah. other thing with cre creative phonetics, which lead to even more um, creative etymologies yeah. um, and otherwise unknown phonetic changes, is because that in 396, we find a mention of Baka. Indeed, the first house, Ina Awala Baitin, established for mankind, is surely the one at Baka, blessed and a guidance for all creatures therein or something. Well, yeah. you know, usually people say that, okay, the Baka of um, 396 and Maka of uh, 4824 are somehow related. Good, but this would work, but the only problem, you know, to oversimplify things to make a dramatic point is that if Baka can become Maka, good, you have to explain the sound change, but then you would have to also explain, because the new grammarians posited the Ausschließlichkeit der Lautgesetze, i.e. that sound changes apply to all words with the same phonetic conditions. So if it's a B before an A in an open syllable or a closed close syllable, in this case with Bakka, then all Bs followed by an A in a closed syllable would have to somehow become M. Yeah, and we it's, don't find that occurring anywhere. Yeah, and the last time I looked at an Arabic dictionary, there was a lot of words that still started with a B. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, so you're Irish, so you know about these sound changes, you know, where you have an M and you pronounce it as a B and... Yeah, or, I think our, yeah, um, our, I think Irish is probably one of the, the few that make those changes back and forth. The other thing that occurred to me as you were talking there is the fact that um, Mecca isn't by the sea, you have to go quite inland, and yet uh, this is a point that Shoemaker makes in his uh, book, Creating the Quran. There's umpteen references to seafaring people in the mm. Quran, and presumably the audience is also familiar with sort of maritime uh, things. And yes, we're supposed to believe that this book was generated, or the words of this book were generated um, in Mecca. Doesn't it's another part of the the thing that doesn't work. No, it doesn't. Good. So the let's say the, um, the geographical outlook in the Quran is certainly not what you would expect from something written in Mecca. So you, of course, in the Sirat have this peculiar episode that when the Kaaba in the Sirah of Ibn Hisham, you have the peculiar episode of when the Kaaba burns around around just before Muhammad becomes a prophet. And they have to build a roof on the front part of it. And the Arabs don't know how to do it. And the Sirat goes at great lengths trying to explain, OK, good, Muhammad was not involved in this heathen cult which had come to be partaken in the Kaaba. So he was always true to you know the revealed religion of Abraham. But he was also an important person in the city of Mecca. So, you know, when people didn't know further, you asked the, you know, the leading citizen of Mecca, which who just happened to be Muhammad. Yeah. Good. So without him taking part, you know, his advice. And anyway, it's a it's a rather long story. But, you know, it turns out it just so happens 
that there happens to be an Egyptian in Mecca at the period. Good, and at this period, an Egyptian is obviously a Christian. And the Egyptian knows how to build wooden roofs. And he says, yeah, I can build your roof. And, you know, you know, it gives the secret uh, roof building plans. And they're going, it's great. And, it, you know, but, you know, now we just need wood. And Mohammed, who's not just a leading citizen, but is informed of all the local gossip, just happens to know that a Greek ship had uh, wrecked a Jada. Yeah, very conveniently, yeah. Very conveniently, you know, so he sends off an expedition party, so they go and they uh, glean the wood from this shipwreck and they bring it back and, you know, and it's always, it's a very nice ecumenical story too because you've got the whole world there. You've got the Egyptians, you've got the Greeks, and you've got the Arabs and Muhammad coordinating it all. No, but the, let's say the geographical outlook of the Quran does not correspond to um, what we find, uh, what we, what one might, you know, it's not a solid argument. You have to be careful with this because, um, you know, if according to tradition, tradition, Muhammad was a merchant and got around a lot and all of these guys were on caravans, you know, you could make the argument, but it is nonetheless indeed rather surprising that the nautical terminology and the seafaring metaphors or an analogies are quite prominent. And, you know, it's always a thing with the uh, with these texts. Um, you know, if in the New Testament or in the Bible, you know, you find something like the Lamb of God. Um, you know, and I'm speaking you know I'm Canadian so you know where I grew up there were no lambs I mean nobody had seen a sheep ever in their life you know so at school we were always a little bit perplexed by this uh what it meant because nobody had seen a sheep but so you know you always it, you know so the bible has to be have been written somewhere where sheep were a prominent part of agriculture or the economy or something yeah you know otherwise you would have said the zebra of god or the something else uh i don't know but yeah. you know so yeah if you were to say for example hypothetically the zebra of god and i don't want to be disrespectful but just to make a point you're probably yeah. not looking at a text that was written in syro palestine in late antiquity or in antiquity yeah, definitely. Yeah. So the seafaring uh, analogy is there. So we have Baka in um, 396. And what we also find, which is interesting, is that according to most commentators, that in 1437, we find another description of this location in more detail. Lord, lo, I have settled some of my posterity in an uncultivable, uncultivable valley near unto thy house, in the Baitika Muharami, O Lord, that they may establish proper worship. So incline some hearts of men that they may yearn toward them and provide thou them with fruits in order that they may be thankful. Good. So we have here a barren and uncultivable valley somewhere otherwise unnamed. So the relationship between Maka and Baka remains unclear. And this unnamed um, valley is um, unclear. We also find that in the Quran that Baka is home to the first house. Good. How we interpret uh, Lil Nasi, uh, for whom it is, is it founded for the people or by the people? I would say it's founded by the people and not for the people. Yeah. Um, but um, good. So we then have good. When you look at Islamic tradition, everything is explained, and we can actually stop the conversation uh, now. But um, what we know from Islamic tradition that is that the original Qibla or direction of prayer. Was towards was Jerusalem? Asham. Well, Asham to the north, and then to some north. accounts to Jerusalem. 
And then we find later accounts that it was um, that Muhammad always prayed with Jerusalem and Makkah in one line. But this is later harmonizing texts. Yeah. According to Islamic tradition itself, Muhammad is said to have changed the direction of prayer only in Medina, and not because he was somehow in exile, but we'll discuss that in another thing, the whole problem with the Hijra. Yeah. But after the local <clears throat> Jews in Medina, and remember that these Jews in Medina are only attested in the Islamic tradition, but when they refuse to uh, convert, good. What Qibla actually means, well, that is a product for another lecture. I would, because we only find it in 2, 142 to 145. And whether that actually there means direction of prayer, I have my doubts. I would tend to assume it means something like Kabbalah, which in Jewish tradition, it's not the Kabbalah, these esoteric mystical texts, this mystical work from the Middle not Ages. Not knowledge, no. No, 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 but no. Kabbalah, Kabbalah in Semitic is something you do face to face. So because you have Kabbalah in the second in Arabic, which means to kiss. It's something yeah. you do in front of somebody. Yeah. And the Syrians, you know, who are a bit like, you know, the, you know, excuse my um, sarcasm, but, you know, a bit like the Germans used to be in the bad old days. Um, the Assyrians were a warlike people, so Kabbalah, Kabbalah in uh, Akkadian or in Assyrian Akkadian means something like to fight. Yeah. So it's something you do face to face. And you could, you could face in the direction of prayer. That's probably what came to be intended. But Kabbalah, actually in Hebrew or in Jewish tradition, so when Moses went up on Mount Sinai and talked with the Lord, face to face, he got scriptures revealed. And according to Jewish tradition, some were written and some were spoken. The uh, Torah uh, Shebal Pei, the uh, spoken Torah, the oral Torah. Yeah. Um, and, but you have here in Judaism, or Judaism later, in Jewish tradition, let us say, I don't want to lay myself down when, which period we're talking about right now, but they make a distinction between the Torah, the Pentateuch, the five books of Moses, and the rest of the Bible and the rest of tradition. And halakha, so Jewish law, can, must be derived from the Torah, and it can be supported by other parts of Scripture, the prophets and the writings, the Ketuvim and the Nevi'im. But you need to base it, base it on the Torah, the Pentateuch. Um, and what you find is that everything, you've got the Torah, and everything else are the Kabbalah, you know, revealed scriptures, but not the Torah, you know. And sort of Kabbalah, and if you look in the context of Surah 2, you know, especially from verse 100 onwards, he's talking about, you know, all of this, you know, everything I'm saying now, I already revealed to Moses, or Abraham, or whoever. So you could translate it there as previously revealed scripture. It doesn't necessarily, all that I'm saying is the idea that this refers to the direction of prayer. Well, that doesn't really make sense in the text, and it uh, doesn't really have any solid philological backing. So I would suggest there. Can I, can I just kind of respond to, to just a little bit to what you were saying there? I got the impression that it, that the Kabbalah is something that you face in the sense it could be even the sense of conflict. AJ Juice mentioned that in Ottoman times, there were some of the mosques at that time faced where they were aiming to conquer. So could it have had more of a, a military significance in the early days in the sense that they, they wanted to conquer Jerusalem. So we're talking to say the 630s around that period, 614, that it had that, that type well, of already significance. Conquered. They were already yeah. Arabs in Jerusalem then. 
Yeah. Because you know, you've got the Christmas sermon of Sophronius, I think at 634. Yeah, but so, on, if 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 we assume that maybe there's an element of the text that may have uh, originated from those times, and that that um, because Surah two has, um, I think it's Surah two, isn't it? That's where the the cable is mentioned. It has archaic spelling of Abraham. Oh, so it does. Possibly it's an does. older text. Well, let's just say that the orthography of the Rasam of Surah 2 displays in many cases cert uh, certain archaisms. I'll concur with that, but I would... So where does the when was the Quran written? The surahs were they all written at the same time? What was when did it become a book? These are open questions. My problem with this analysis implies that there is some relation, direct relationship between the Quran and Islamic tradition, which there may be. Not, not wasn't it wasn't necessarily what I was intending there, but yeah. that perhaps that there was one snippet. Uh, maybe it could have been as much as just a, a small piece of writing, like like I'm holding here, that was incorporated. That they considered a valuable text for whatever reason. That maybe originated from earlier times. Very different from but, but I, I the later text. I kind of have the impression that the. You know, because the, the huge problem that we have is what is the relationship of the Quran with Islam, if you look at it on yeah. based on the evidence. Because, you know, if you look, theoretically, the, um, the, um, the um, only real book religion would be Islam, because it, you know, it's dependent, claims to be dependent on the Quran. Yeah. But if you look more closely, the Quran doesn't really play a major role, you know, you know, in the uh, in Islam itself, because you've got the Sunnah for that, where you, yeah. So the relationship there. So my thing, good, you know, whatever is happening in Ottoman times, we'll leave that out of the discussion That's for it. now. Yeah. But I would be severely surprised if we find. A reference to events in the seventh century in the Quran. I think if the Quran is anything, it's a liturgical text, and not uh, that doesn't really make too many historical um, illusions. Because I mean, how many historical figures do we know in the text? You know, and it's yeah. You know, then you would have to assume that the KGBs at work here. You know heavily yeah. encoding something, but, you know, or, you know, with the Enigma machine, so, and then yeah. they throw away the Enigma machine, so nobody can crack it. Yeah, yeah. So I would doubt it. But yeah. let us just say that the direction of prayer here, because we know in Islamic tradition it changed only later to Mecca, yeah. was originally to the north, and if we remember that Tabari says they, then even Muhammad had signs installed in the mosques, you know, new direction of prayer, this way, not that way, um, and yeah. um, what have you. Um, good. Um, what we have to then, if we just look briefly at the pilgrimage in um, um, Mecca, is um, the... Um, the Hajj. Well, this, like all of the five pillars of Islam, they're all borrowings from Aramaic. Yeah. And Hajj is borrowed from Aramaic, but ultimately derives from Chag in Hebrew. And this refers to the um, three Jewish pilgrimage festivals, Passover, Shavuot, and Sukkot. Um, good. We find this in 397, 
and the pilgrimage to the house, Khidju al Baiti, is a duty unto Allah for mankind, for him who can find a way thither to get there. Good. When you're in Mecca itself, so on the uh, 8th of Dhu al Hijjah in Mecca, once you've entered the consecrated state of Ihram, you have the first Tahwaf, the sevenfold circumambulation of the Kaaba. This is followed by the Sai, the run between the hills of Asafa and uh, Al Marwa. And then the pilgrims drink from the Zamzam well, and then they go to the plains of Mount Arafat to keep watch and spend the night on the plains of um, Mus Dalifa and a symbolic stoning of the devil by lapidating three pillars. And afterwards, the pilgrims shave their heads, perform a sacrificial ritual, and celebrate the three-day Idu, Idu al-Adha. Good. When you look at this closely, and I'll just, um, I won't repeat what Wellhausen said over a century ago in the rest of the Arabish and Haydn tombs, that the, we have to make a distinction between the rites that happen inside of Mecca and outside, so at Arafat and uh, Muzdalifa and, Mi and in Mina that have nothing to do. According to Wellhausen, the rites outside of Mecca are old and archaic and the ones inside um, um, uh, are probably um, recent. Good. Um, yeah. So when we look at this and we're talking about, okay, what is Mecca? And is this actually referred to, what is actually being referred to? And is this um, being uh, uh, referred to? Um, good, we find in 2.158, Lo, Asafa and al Marwa, usually considered as mountains, um, are among the indications of Allah. It is therefore no sin for him who is on pilgrimage. Um, it is therefore no sin for him who is on pilgrimage to the house of Allah or visits it to go around them. And he who doeth good of his own accord for him, lo, Allah is responsive, aware. Good. What was interesting here, we see no direction mention of Mecca. We see Asafa wal Marwa. Good. If we summarize what we've come to or what we've seen so far, Mecca is mentioned once in 4824, but not in relation to the Hajj. Um, good, so we find Mecca when Mecca mentioned once in the Quran, 4824, but not in relation to the Hajj. 396 mentions a first house located somewhere called Baka, as we pointed out, the relationship between Baka and Mecca is unclear, which may be and mentioned the infertile valley in 1437 at the house, but if there's only one God, does he have more than one house, temple? And a pilgrimage to the house is suggested in 397. As part of the Islamic Hajj, we find the run between Asafa and Wal Marwa in 2158, um, and this is where we left off, I think. The What we have here is that the Islamic um, pilgrimage tends to, the right that we have, that we see today, annually, is based on a patchwork of disparate verses um, from throughout the um, Quran. Um, um, and that the rights outside of Mecca and the rights inside seem to be related to two different um, traditions. Good, just the point of semantics here, in Semitic languages, the noun bait, house, is also used as a temple, because this is where a god lives. You know, some languages, like in Akkadian, you have egal from Sumerian big house, which becomes heikal in Arabic and heikal in Hebrew. Um, 
as a loan word, but that's a different um, tradition. So, for example, in the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament, we have Bivet Adonai in Psalm 134.1, for example, which um, refers to the house of the Lord, which is the um, temple. So, good. But in the Bible, this always refers to the temple in Jerusalem. And no offense to anybody, but I mean, a temple of a monotheistic God, if there's only one, it's something big, it's something impressive. You know, even in polytheistic societies, yeah. you know, your Zeus temple or your whoever temple is a big affair because you want to prove that your God is uh, big. Let us just say size does matter sometimes. Yeah. Um, so bait, especially in the Semitic monotheistic tradition, tends to always refer here in this sense to the temple in uh, Jerusalem. What is interesting here is if we um, go to um, uh, the Antiquities of Josephus, Book 11, Paragraph 329, and this is when I think it's apocryphal, but when Alexander supposedly visits Jerusalem, and Alexander, being a Macedonian, a, not a proper Greek, and conquering the world, whenever he conquered something, he needed to somehow ascertain his legitimacy. So not far from Jerusalem, for example, at Tyre, he besieged, which was an island at the time, and he built this causeway, and besieged Tyre, and the reason for that was that the Tyrians, when Alexander came, they were willing to surrender. They said, okay, good, if you want to take us over, go ahead. We don't like the Persians anyway, so... Uh... And the only demand of Alexander was to enter the Melkart, the Heraclius temple. And then the Phoenicians, the Tyrians said, you can do anything you want, but you're not going in the temple. Why? Because they knew that if uh, Alexander entered the Melkart temple, he would sort of identify with this god and he would become their god and then they would have to obey him and, you know, anything but that, you know, we don't want to apoth apotheosize you. So then they said, we're not going to surrender. So Alexander builds this causeway and the Tyrians sacrifice children, but too few too late. And uh, good, the rest is history. When he comes to Jerusalem, it's a different matter because according to this tradition, which is probably not history as such, you know, the Jews only have this one God who's living somewhere up in the heavens and Alexander can't really identify with them. So he does the next best thing and he asks if he can sacrifice to this God. And, you know, according to Josephus, the high priest has no problems and goes, you know, I'll give you a speed course on how to sacrifice to the Lord and we'll go in and do it together and it all happens. And then it says, um, oh no, it's on his Alexander's way to Jerusalem and Josephus, I think, I'll read the older translation. And when he understood that he was not far from the city, he went out in procession with the priests and the multitude of the citizens. The procession was venerable and in a matter of it different from that of other nations. It reached a place called Safa, which name translated into Greek signifies skopos, a prospect, for you have thence a prospect both of Jerusalem and of the temple. So, what he says in Greek, he goes to a place called Safa, which name translated into Greek, Skopos, signifies a prospect, a vantage point. Skopos, that's where we get periscope from and, you know, look. And, um, um, good. The point here um, is that this Skopos is Mount Skopos today in Jerusalem, where the Hebrew University is, one of the highest places around the city. In Hebrew, it's still called Har Hatsofim, the Watchman's Mountain, i.e. where you can look 
at the city, because in post-biblical Hebrew, a tzof is a pilgrim who has seen Jerusalem. And this is where we find it in Arabic is uh, Jabal al-Mashhad, the witness mountain. Um, good. So what we see here is this Tzafa is Mount Scopus, which is what is seemingly implied in the Quran. But if you look at Safa today in Mecca, you know, it's this little mound boulder. of yeah. boulder. Yeah, you know, a small-sized boulder. Um, not really your average mountain, you know. Um, uh, you know, I call them uh, Dutch mountains, but... Uh, yeah. uh, you know, it's not really the the real um, things. Um, like, just yep. something occurred to me as you were saying that is it's a bit of a, a maybe a pun, but uh, you know, you use the word telescope. You know, the the far scopus, and it reminds me of the the farthest mosque. You know, looking at it from the Temple Mount, mm. the farthest mosque. I don't know if it's just a coincidence, but it kind of struck me that's an that maybe that's an interesting thought. Yeah. You know, it is the reference to the, the farthest mosque. I think it's in Surah 17.1. Mm -hmm. um, uh, who took his servant by night from the sacred mosque to the farthest mo uh, mosque. Um, could it be a reference to there? Um, and the servant could be uh, could be anyone there. It's not clear who, who the servant is. It could be Jesus. It could be... It could be... Um, I don't know, it could be a contemporary uh, at the time of the writing, whenever this was written originally. Well, this is the difficult thing with the Quran. Yeah. The context to um, lay hold of, and this is well, what we're trying to do here, but yeah, good, with the farthest mosque, well, that's still a nut to be cracked, let us say. It is, yeah. But if we go back here, we have the, so... If, Safa, we also find in Jerusalem, and there it has a long um, tradition. If we go to um, um, Marwa, and you look at uh, 2 Chronicles 3.1, the Temple Mount the, is the Har Habayit, is Har Hamoria, which is the... Uh, Mount Moria, which where according to Genesis 22, 2, the sacrifice of Isaac nearly occurred. Of course, good, without sparing you the phonetic details, but Moria and Marawa are the same things. And of course, Marawa being the Temple Mount, is where we where the Habayit, the house, Al Bayit, yeah. was. Um you know, in monotheism, well, this is where the monotheistic God of the Bible seems to be presumed in the Quran, Allah, um, exists. Um, the Bayit, which is a blessed and a guidance for the worlds in 396. So um, we see that Safa is Har HaSofim, the Safa of um, Yosefus. And uh, Moria is Marwa, the Temple Mount. So then, what we only have left with the Quran that we have to deal with uh, briefly is Bakka. Bakka is, of course, mentioned in the Bible in Psalm 84 7. We'll just read from verse 5. Blessed are those who dwell in your house, Bethaka, in whose heart are the ways of them who passing through the valley of Baca, the Emeka Baca, the valley of weeping, make it a well. The rain also fills the pools. They go from strength to strength. Every one of them in Zion appears before God. O Lord of hosts, hear my prayer. Give ear, O God of Jacob. Salah. Behold, O God, our shield, and look upon the face of your anointed. Um, the here we see Baka. There are differing views of the etymology. I still see 
it in the original biblical sense as referring to the root um, baka, which means weeping, the veil of tears in English, I think it is. It's not far from Jerusalem, and it's somewhere that pilgrims going to the temple would have had to have passed through to get there. Um, what's interesting is that in the Targum, the Jewish Aramaic translation of this psalm verse, the Valley of Tears, Emek Habakkah, is rendered as the Valley of Gehenna in Eruvin 19a. Yeah. Uh, um, good. This is a long tradition with the Moloch sacrifices, the child sacrifices that probably once uh, took place here, which is the Valley of Ben Hinnom, Gehenna. But the um, the idea is, according to the Talmud, is that the people who are condemned to Gehenna to hell are probably not happy about it, and they're crying. Yeah. Um, good. This is then related in Joel 3. For behold, in those days, in that time, I shall bring forth again the captivity of Judah and Jerusalem. I will also gather all nations and bring them into bring them down into the valley of Jehoshaphat and will plead with them there. So it has something to do with um, judgment. As I said, the this valley historically with the tie with Gehenna in the valley of Ben-Hanom has to do with the book of Jeremiah. And this is where the child sacrifices took place, the Moloch, where children were burnt. And if anybody is doubting it, yes, it really actually happened. Um, whatever we may think of it and how good or bad it was, but that is a different talk for a um, uh, different time. This also plays with asirat, a role in Islamic um, eschatology, this hair-thin gangplank everybody um, um, has to walk through. But of course, this is the... Um, unfertile valley that um, because nothing grows there because this is where hell is or what became to be hell Gehenna yes. in yeah, yeah. the New Testament so the my argument would be here that the so what Makkah is in this context well that's a matter of conjecture we don't have a lot to go on but certainly Baka, Safa and Marwa all have a long tradition well established in and around Jerusalem. Yeah. Um, this would mean that the original site of pilgrimage was Jerusalem and not Mecca, which would make more sense. And even Madame Neuvert um, and others have pointed out the importance of Jerusalem for early Islam. And it's kind of hard to have a monotheism, especially what seems to have been happening with the Umayyads, uh, apocalyptic eschatological monotheism, um, that doesn't involve Jerusalem. It hardly makes um, sense. All of the sites are there. I think what happens is that it's clear, I mean, good, and if you look at the later criticisms, for example, of Abdul Malik, uh, Abdul Malik for, for building the Dome of the Rock, you know, it was that he diverted pilgrimage from Mecca because, you know, the Dome of the Rock is just too splendid, which it is. And it's much more attractive than whatever you have at Mecca. And he siphoned off the pilgrimages to there. Well, this is, of course, seems to be rather anachronistic. And, you know, later they didn't understand that, uh, you know, they invented the story of Zubair, but... We can go into that another time. I don't want to get into details here. But, you know, it was occupied, so he had to come up with something. But the criticism is there was no pilgrimage to, or he divided, diverted the pilgrimage to Mecca. But the more valid question is, did he know about a pilgrimage to Mecca at that period? Because if you look at the Islamic sources, it's all rather in the ninth century that Mecca, really in the eighth, ninth century with the building of the aqueduct and people buying property in Mecca and what have you, that it seems to uh, be important. What we see 
moving into the Abbasid period is that there is no longer uh, any expectation of the imminent end of the world. Um, good. So what you see with you know messianic messianic movements in general. So if you're expecting the end of the world and whoever's going to come to uh, end the world or redeem the world or what have you, they usually land in Jerusalem. So when you're expecting the end of the world or the final judgment or what have you, you get to Jerusalem. When it turns out that somebody miscalculated the date or what have you, well, then you get out of Jerusalem. Yeah, that's, yeah, you want to be as far away as possible from, from that. Yeah, so what, what I'm saying is by the Abbasid period, when there was no longer, and I mean, you see this at the latest with Abdul Malik building of the Dome of the Rock, when you build something like that in stone, but yeah. in how much of the present building is actually his building, but it's clear he built something in stone, yeah. well, then you don't really have any imminent messianic expectation, and then the role of Jerusalem becomes less significant. So the question then is, I think, why um, um, why uh, uh, why Mecca? Uh, 